<laughs> Massey, it's good to be here. It's good to be before you. I'm excited to preach the word today. Anybody ready for the word? All right, let's go ahead and stand on our feet. And we're going to look at um, a couple passages of scripture. So the first can be found in Genesis um, 1, 26. And just kind of stay in Genesis because we're going to flip over to chapter 3. And then from there, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 12. As you turn there, Pastor sends his love to everybody. He got called um, late, late Friday night by his mentor um, with an urgent request to come and preach at his church in Maryland. So Pastor flew there yesterday. He's preaching right now. <laughs> and so he sends his love. He'll be back uh, tonight. So you stuck with me, y'all. <laughs> All right, let's turn to the word. I'm going to read Genesis 1, and I'm going to move quickly because I want to get to the word. Verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and all the small animals that scurry on the ground. And then we're gonna flip over to three. We're gonna start with verse, um, let's see here, six. The B clause, which starts, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Verse 21, and the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. And then our foundational text um, can be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> And I'm going to start with verse 7. And Paul says, Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said to me, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Fam, will you prepare to pray with me? <clears throat> as I preach from the topic, the gift of grace. The gift of grace. Ladies that attended the well, your title, amen. <laughs> your title is the gift of grace continued because God has something new for you, amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, for your grace that is unfathomable, God, that is, that is insufficient for your grace, God, that sustains us and keeps us, Father. And so my prayer this morning is that everyone, Father, online and in this house would gain a true revelation of what grace is. I pray that you would speak in such a way that everybody, Father, regardless of what they are going through, what their particular circumstances are, would receive exactly what they need from you in this moment. And Holy Spirit, I offer myself up to you. I pray that you would remove my nerves, God, my anxiety even, and that you would just flow through me. 
I pray, Father, that we would have an encounter with you that leaves us never the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The gift of grace. Fam, I have come to understand that in most cases when we use the word grace, it's, we use it culturally, which by definition tends to have more to do with someone having a certain elegance about them or a certain form or manner of action. This word grace can be used to describe our former first lady, Michelle Obama. She has a grace about her in the way that she carries herself, in the way that she even clothes herself, but also in how she served this country. And this definition, this cultural definition, isn't wrong. But the problem comes in, fam, when we continue to use a cultural definition to understand a theological matter, like the grace of God. Because when we as believers use the word grace to articulate an action that has been extended towards us by God our Father, we can't simply refer to it as an elegance or beauty. That just, it doesn't do. Because the cultural definition doesn't describe the magnitude and the weight that this theological word grace holds. So, Massey, will you allow me to teach you for a minute? Can we go to the classroom for a second? All right, let's go to school. The word grace in its purest form, if you're taking notes, refers to the pardoning of our sins, which means we were not only released from having to pay for our sins, but we were also forgiven of our sins. Now, when we hear this sometimes, though, we can kind of gloss over the weight that this message carries. Because oftentimes when we think about forgiveness, we're thinking about it from our cultural, experiential, and even Western lens of what it means to forgive. So the language or the idea of God forgiving us just doesn't seem to hold that much weight. Because oftentimes for us, when we say we forgive someone, there is still an awareness in our minds, whether consciously or subconsciously, of what the person did that needed to be forgiven. When we say we forgive somebody, we're often still keeping score. We have a record of the person's wrongs. We got that mental file cabinet, y'all, where we got all the offenses that they did dating back to day one. Literally, that's right, Venus. And ladies, don't let a brother hurt us in some kind of way. Our necks begin to turn and twirl. Our mouth begin to pop. Oh, he ain't going to hurt me like that no more. Brothers, when you are offended, when a, when a woman or somebody hurts you, I, what I hear, what I heard was that y'all may start thinking, I'm not going to open myself up like that again. Not to be hurt like that again. And so then, when we say we forgive, what we often mean is, I forgive, but I won't forget. And so what happens then is our understanding of forgiveness is marked by what we mean by forgiveness. Now, don't, I, I don't want you all to misunderstand me 
because I'm not saying that it's not important to have boundaries in place, especially if somebody has crossed an emotional, physical um, boundary in your life that led you to have to alter the way that you interact with that person. But watch this. There's a difference, Macedonia, between a boundary and a wall. When boundaries are implemented from a place of hurt, anger, shame, disappointment, or pain, what we see ourselves implementing as a boundary is actually a wall that we've erected to keep ourselves and our hearts from being hurt like that again. And this family is not the goal. A wall of self-protection, while it may keep you from being hurt again, the byproduct of this wall is that it prevents you from receiving God's love. And it also then keeps us from having meaningful, healthy relationships with other people. Because we've got this wall up that we have in place to protect ourselves. So if a wall is up, while my heart may be safe, nothing can come in and nothing can go out. All right. So watch this. Y'all with me? I know y'all rocking with me. I learned this firsthand earlier this year. My husband and I went to um, the Healing the Heart Retreat at Living Waters Retreat Center. And at that point, I had been working with my counselor on implementing some healthy boundaries for myself. So I'm putting boundaries everywhere. And so when we go to the retreat, <laughs> what I didn't know until I got there was that because I still had some unspoken hurts from some previous moments of disagreement with my husband, or shall I say some heated fellowship? <laughs> because I was still holding on to those hurts, what I thought were boundaries were actually walls that were preventing emotional intimacy with him. And can I be real, for the married sisters, when we put up walls, not only does it prevent emotional intimacy, but physical intimacy. So I had some walls up, and it wasn't until we got there that I understood my hurting heart had erected some walls and required the Spirit of God to really dig down to the root of what was at the root of those walls so he could tear them down. So watch this, boundaries are important, but boundaries that flow from a healed and healthy heart. Does that make sense? Okay. And so then, if our boundaries don't flow from a healed and healthy heart, we then map our understanding of God and forgiveness on to the work that Jesus did on the cross. And so then, it becomes difficult for us to hear that we've been forgiven of our sins or that our sins have been, have been pardoned. When G, but what we don't realize is that when Jesus forgives us, he doesn't forgive in the same way that we forgive. When Jesus forgives us, he extends grace towards us and is actually releasing us from our sins. Can I go even further, Massey? Which means then that all the things that came into the world as a result of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, 
the separation that it caused between God and man, the disruption of intimacy that we were created to experience with him, the shame, guilt, and condemnation that we inherited as a result of that original sin was punished on the cross and we were all released from it. His blood, his shed blood on the cross, fam, is an act of grace. In fact, Jesus dying on the cross, being beaten and crucified for sins that he did not commit, shedding his innocent blood is grace personified. And the reason it is a gift the reason it is an offering is because we didn't have to work to receive it. You don't have to have all the right behavior. You don't need to be born into the right family. It's not based on how much you give or tithe or how many ministries you serve on. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have behind your name or whether or not your family grew up in this church. All that is needed to receive this gift is that we believe he did it for us. And this is what makes it grace, that I did not do anything to deserve it. This is what makes it grace, that I didn't have to work to earn it, because if I had to work to earn it, it would no longer be grace. It would no longer be grace but it's given freely to those who believe. And the exchange that takes place between God, you and I, is proportionately unequal. I need you all to hear this. But here's the thing. Grace was never designed to be a one and done kind of thing. Turn to the person near you and say, it's about to get tight. It's about to get tight, but it's going to be right. But as it gets tight, it might mess with some of your theology. And that's okay. I'm here for it. But for some of us, grace, it starts and it stops at the cross, meaning that your only experience of grace is at the point of salvation. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in relationship with a God that says that I've been forgiven, but the forgiveness and grace I receive stops at the point that I place my faith in him. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in relationship with a God that offers me grace and says that I'm forgiven. But moving forward, if I make a mistake, grace is no longer available. And that is not God's intent. Grace is intended to be unfolded in our lives, throughout our lives, for the rest of our lives, Macedonia. And watch this. The culmination of grace is when Jesus Christ returns and creates a new heaven and a new earth. That is grace. It is designed to continually be unfolded and therefore constantly experienced by everyone who calls on the name of Jesus. So to break this down even more, I, I want to use some terms that are not biblical, but are practical, okay? You're not going to find these in the, in the Bible. 
but I'm going to use them because I think they will help you to understand, to wrap our minds around grace a little bit more, okay? So the language I'm going to use is layers and levels. There are layers or levels of grace. There is a layer of grace that is unfolded before every human being, regardless of whether or not they've placed their faith in God. But simply because they were created by the hand of God and are God's creation, grace is extended towards them. Which is why then Jesus says in Matthew 5.45 about forgiving um, about forgiving those that have hurt us, our enemies. He says this, for God gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends his rain on the just and the unjust. It don't make no sense how they can still receive rain and water and sunlight and their crops can grow, but they don't have a relationship. But that is grace. That's a level of it that every human being receives, regardless of whether they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But grace, because grace is God, his very nature is grace. Grace has always existed, even in the Old Testament. But watch this. Grace in the Old Testament was kind of in the background. It was there, but it was in the background. I, I love music. My husband and our children will tell you, I always have music on. Like, I go to bed listening to some quiet, soaking music. I wake up and I'm playing music. You know, my husband will laugh at me because I always have music on. And I love all kinds of music, y'all. I love old school hip hop. I love um, contemporary R&B. I like old school R&B, oldies, but goodies. I love some reggae and some African music. Don't put some on, because you might see Pastor D do a little step or two. I love music. I love gospel and contemporary Christian. And I absolutely love jazz music. And one of the things about jazz, or the reason that I love it, is because if I'm in a space where I need to think about something or process something, jazz, that's right, doesn't have any words, so I can still have my music on, right? I can still have my music on. I can still have some, some smooth beats on. But I'm able to still process whatever I need to process because the music I have on is background noise. So much so that unless I'm really tuned in to the music, I can actually miss that it's there. I can forget that it's on. And that's kind of how grace was in the Old Testament. It was there, but unless you were really tuned into it, you could miss that it was there. But grace, family, actually shows up right away. As soon, right after Adam and Eve sin. Grace was there. And the way that we see it first is in Genesis 21. Jesus said, I mean, the word of God says, the Lord God made clothing for them from skins of an animal. Now, when I was first studying for this message, I read that and and kept reading. And the Holy Spirit told me to go back. And when I went back, he told me to go up to some of the earlier verses. And so I stopped at verse 7 and read this. 
At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Why is this important? Prior to this moment, Adam and Eve had no idea they were naked. They knew absolutely nothing about shame for that matter. They were naked before the Lord because they were created to be naked, not to have anything to hide or conceal from God. But the moment they sin, their eyes are immediately open and they realize they're naked. And all of a sudden, an emotion they were never created to feel enters into the picture. Shame. They feel shame. And because they feel shame, they cover themselves and they hide behind fig leaves. But God, in his grace never intended for them to have to experience shame. And so God takes it upon himself to sacrifice an animal that had nothing to do with their sin. This animal was harmless, minding his own business, but because his children were now ashamed of their nakedness, God decides to step in and kill this animal and he removes the fur of the animal and he clothed them in animals fur because they were always designed to be covered by him God recognized that those fig leaves they used to cover themselves would eventually waste away they would fall off y'all can't y'all see them running in the fig leaves running behind them and they're exposed again but God says no no baby I'm not letting you go out like that I will cover you even though you messed up even though you sinned I'm covering you with the fur of this animal that didn't deserve to die. But because he has what I need to cover my children, I'll cover you. And when God does this, it is an indication of what is to come when Jesus Christ, the lamb, will be crucified and shed blood from his innocent body to cover us of our sins. This is grace. This is God's grace. God decides to cover their missteps and to cover their bad choices. And when he does it, he foreshadows the crucifixion that is to come. And so what happens then when Jesus is crucified? When his blood is shed, that shed blood is then imparted to those who place their faith in him. And so when, G, when we then go to him, once we receive him, from that point on, every time we go to him, we are seen by his blood. He doesn't see us anymore. He sees his blood. And so although you messed up last night, when you go before him, he sees his blood. And when he sees his blood, he declares they are righteous. Everybody say righteous. Not right, but righteous. There's a difference, Macedonia. Being righteous has nothing to do with what I've done. It has nothing to do with my right behavior or my good works. Being righteous has everything to do with what's been done for you and I. The blood of Jesus Christ is what makes us righteous. And because his blood makes us righteous, 
It puts all of us on the same playing field. Because it's not based on what I do or don't do, how much I serve or don't serve, how many a times I pray or don't pray. Because it's all based on his blood and everybody who places their faith in him has access to his blood, it it puts everybody on the same playing field. So that then means if you got a doctor before your name or a criminal record following your name, The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus makes you righteous. The blood of Jesus is what makes you righteous. And this is why, family, we can say confidently, I know it was the blood. And this is why we can declare that the blood still works. Because it does, family. Because every time he looks at you, he sees his blood. Not what you did. Not what you didn't do. I know people may place weight on your sins. But God doesn't place weight on your sins. He doesn't put them on a scale and weigh them. He sees his blood. And his blood still works, Macedonia. This is why the religious leaders wanted to crucify Jesus. This is why the gospel was so dangerous. This is why they needed to crucify him because they wanted to silence this message that he preached that was absolutely insane. It don't make no kind of sense how I, with all my religious degrees and knowledge, can't sit at the table with a man who sits with tax collectors and sinners. It don't make sense, but grace don't make sense. It doesn't make any kind of sense. And watch this, because you and I didn't do anything to earn it, we can't do anything to lose it. What kind of stuff is that? What kind of God is that? that he would pour out his grace on me and see sins that I've committed in the past and see stuff that I did today and be aware of future sins and yet still pour out his grace on me and declare that there's nothing I can do to lose it. But don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted, fam, because grace doesn't mean then or give me a license. To just do what I want to do when I want to do it, because I know God's going to extend grace. I got to speak on this for a moment. Because some of us think that because of the grace of God, we can live any kind of way because God knows our heart and he will then forgive us. But I need you to understand that grace is not to be abused. Grace is not to be misused. Grace is not insurance that allows us to do what we want because we know we got good coverage. Grace, family, is assurance. Grace is not insurance, it's assurance. It's the assurance of knowing that if I mess up and when I mess up and if I make a mistake and when I sin, I can still come before his throne boldly and humbly because he doesn't see my mistakes. 
he sees his blood. And so watch this. This is why Paul in Romans 6.15 says grace has set us free from the law. Does that then mean we should keep on sinning? Of course not. You become a slave to whatever it is you choose to obey. So the response to grace is not to abuse it. But when you get a real revelation of what grace is, when you get a real revelation that none of us has actually gotten what we deserve, when you get a real revelation that I shouldn't be standing here clothed in my right mind preaching to all of you, that I should still be at Western Sight, when you get a real revelation of what grace is the grace of God makes you want to offer yourself back up to him and so by grace we come to understand that God makes an exchange with us. By grace, we learn that God will take the lesser gift, our weaknesses, in exchange for the greater gift, his grace and his power and righteousness. And this doesn't mean that we are invaluable family. It just means that what we offer up to God will always pale in comparison to what we receive in exchange from God because of grace or charis. As the Greek writers say, grace allows us to offer up our lesser gift in exchange for something of greater value that don't make no sense. So much so that people can see you and wonder how was he the one slinging rock and selling dope and smoking weed and now he's up in there. Baby, it's the grace of God. How was she the one sleeping around, minding everybody's business, but serving like that? Honey, it's the grace of God. It's the grace. It's grace, family. Grace is why we're here. Grace is why we're standing. I know it don't make sense. But his grace is what brought you here. Which brings me to my final point and foundational text. 1 Corinthians 15 first, before we go to 12. Paul says, but whatever I am now, it's all because God poured his grace on me. In other words, you would be right to appraise my worth and value by what I did last night or yesterday. And if you did, you would have every right to say, I have no value. But because my worth and your worth isn't based on what I did or do, but who I'm connected to, my connection to God automatically takes the stakes up. You're right, I'm not educated. You're right, I have no reason being here, but the grace of God got me here. You're right, family, that I should not be looking as good as I did, given the way I was broke down five years ago, but it's the grace of God that I am who I am, that you are who you are. 
Grace is what opened the door, not your connections. Grace is what chased you down, not your friend. Grace is what won't let you go, not your mama. It's the grace of God. And so God says, I want to partner up with you. And I don't want to partner with what looks good and with what makes everybody feel good. But I want to partner up with your weaknesses. I want to partner with the part of you that you're embarrassed about. God says, I want to partner up with you, not with what everybody sees, but with what don't nobody know. I want to partner up with your brokenness. I know your father left you over 20 years ago and you're still angry, but baby, it ain't anger, it's sadness. You're hurting and God says, I want to partner up with you. So if you allow me to make this exchange, I'll take your weaknesses in exchange for my strength. I'll take your brokenness in exchange for my grace. I'll take the labels they put on you and I'll change your name only if you offer up your weaknesses. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, yeah, you're right. I could boast because I got a whole lot I could boast about. I've had powerful experiences with God. I've been caught up in the third heaven in such a way where I saw things that nobody sees. But by God's grace, he restrained himself from speaking that. He restrained himself from boasting. And instead of boasting, he used this opportunity to boast or speak about his weaknesses. This thorn in his flesh. Not a literal thorn, but a nuisance of such that kept nagging him. And many scholars don't know if it was a physical limitation or if it was about his emotions and his anger in particular. But whatever it was, it kept getting in the way. Every time he would preach the gospel, he would then turn around mad and talk to the church about how upset he was that they were listening to these false prophets. It caused him a lot of hurt and pain. So much so that he begged God to take it away from him. Three times, the Bible says, he asked God, to remove this thorn, this nuisance, this thing that is causing so much pain in my life. And every time he asked, God said, my grace is all you need for my power works best in weaknesses. I need you to hear me, Macedonia. His grace is all we need, and his power works best in weaknesses. Not in our pride, not in our perfection, not in our mask that suggests we got it all together, but it's the moment that we take off the mask and come before him and admit, God, I'm struggling. God, I don't feel like living in this world. God, I'm dealing with depression. God, I have low self-esteem. That like Paul, we can experience this supernatural exchange that doesn't make any kind of sense. 
But this exchange where God takes the weak things of us. And in return, he gives us his power and he gives us his might and he gives us his grace. And the more that we offer up our weaknesses and our brokenness, the more that our pain becomes a seat for God's glory to reside, the more that we offer up our infirmities and our lack the more that they become a stage for God's power to rest and so God says I want to perform an exchange with you and I know it don't make sense and I know you can't wrap your mind around it, but if you would just give me your weaknesses and say, here I am, Lord, with my weak self. Here I am, God, with my broke self. Here I am, Lord, with my angry and bitter self. Here I am, God, with my broken self. If you would just offer up your weaknesses. I want to perform an exchange because the truth of the matter is, family, that the only thing you can do with a weakness is yoke it up to something greater. The only thing that can be done with something that is weak and broken is to yoke it up with someone greater, someone stronger, someone mightier. And when we do, we experience this powerful cycle of exchanging our weaknesses for his strength and grace and then receiving and experiencing his grace unfold in our lives all the more. It's like a cycle that the more that I offer up my weakness, the more that I receive his grace and his grace props me up. His grace steadies my feet. His grace lifts my head. His grace allows me to speak. Massey, you all think I think some of y'all think, <laughs> maybe not everybody, <laughs> that I love sharing my story or that I'm so vulnerable. The truth is I'm a pretty private person and I don't enjoy putting myself on blast. <laughs> not the least bit. <laughs> Okay, so don't get it twisted. I don't enjoy telling my story, but I learned over the years as God was healing me that every time I kept my mouth closed, the enemy was able to creep in and ridicule me with shame and depression and then he was able to remind me of all that I went through and that I didn't matter and so I would keep my mouth closed feeling so embarrassed about what I went through feeling so ashamed about what I lived through but God as he kept healing me and peeling back the layers slowly but surely he allowed me to open my mouth and tell the story of how over 
five years ago, I suffered a psychotic break that landed me in Western Psych for a whole week, y'all. And I came out, but then I suffered another psychotic break that landed me in St. Clair Hospital. And after that, my situation was so jacked up that they sent me to an outpatient treatment program. Six months I was there. Six months, three days a week I was going. And while I was there, among other women that were also struggling with postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis, we started sharing our stories. And I'll never forget the moment I opened my mouth and told the story, all the shame and embarrassment that I felt, it lessened in me. And so then I said, well, let me tell my story to her. She's struggling with the same thing. And every time I did, I felt less shame and less embarrassed. But at the same time, I experienced this power that wasn't my own, that allowed me to lift my head, that allowed me to walk in the church as the only lady and pastor and Reverend Dion with my jacked up self. And my weaknesses became a seat for his glory to be revealed. So much so, family, that every time I would share, I would learn that as I was sharing and being set free, so would other people. Woo! It was a cycle where every time I offered weaknesses, he gave me and gives me his power and his grace. And so I just keep offering my weaknesses to him because I've learned I can't go wrong. I just keep offering my brokenness to him because I recognize that his grace is sufficient. It's enough, it's enough. That's all we need, family. That is the good news. That is all we need. His grace is sufficient. Amen, amen. As we prepare to close, I want to ask you to close your eyes and get into your mind the thing or things that you're ashamed of, that you've been trying to keep from everybody else so that you can appear to be strong but internally, you are breaking. Whatever that is, I want you to get that in your mind. And as you do, in your own way, I want you to offer that to him. Maybe for you, the offering is you lifting your hands and whispering, I'm tired of struggling with depression, God. I really am. Maybe for you the offering is coming to the altar and laying before him and admitting, I really want to take my own life. Or maybe the offering is you being honest about the bitterness you still carry because of whoever hurt you. 
and you can't seem to forgive them in your own way as the worship team ministers I just want you to offer your weakness thank you Lord thank you Lord how much it costs to see
exchange with us. Where as we give you our weakness, you in turn yoke up with us and pour out your grace and your power that is enough for us. I pray in the name of Jesus that for every hurting place, every broken place, every confused place in us, God, that your grace would yoke up to those areas and that we would experience, God, by the power of your spirit, the sufficiency of your grace. I pray, God, for every place of anger and disappointment, that you would pour out your spirit and that you would speak to those places in us and that you would remind us, God, that vengeance belongs to you, that you would remind us, God, that in the same way that you don't see our faults and you don't see our mistakes, but you see your blood and your blood is what forgives us and makes us righteousness. God, by your grace, give us the strength to forgive, to let go of the person or the people that harmed us and to know, God, that as long as you have us, we have everything that we need. And God, because you told us to pray for our enemies, we also now lift up the very people that hurt us the very people that saddened us. We lift them up to you, God. And we ask that you would meet them in such a profound way that they would have an encounter with you that changes their very being that they would come to know the living God that we serve. And that as they come to know you, they too would have an encounter where, that causes them to place their faith in you and receive your forgiveness, God. We thank you, Lord, that your blood still works and that your grace is sufficient. And so as free sons and daughters, we lift our hands to you and we shout, God, a shout of joy, a shout, Father, that declares that we are not what we've been through. But we are yours. And so we thank you for meeting us in this space. Continue to have your way and unfold your gift of grace in our lives, throughout our lives, for the rest of our lives.
up. I want to invite you to experience a love that is like no other. Our ministers and leaders are coming to the front. And if that is you, I want you to know that he's got grace for you too. And the only thing that he asks is that you place your faith in him. And so as everyone presses their way out, I want to encourage you to press your way forward. And if you need somebody to walk with you, just slip your hand in the air. Because we would be glad to do it. Now, family, as we prepare to leave this place, but never from his presence, we declare now unto him who is able to keep us from falling to the only wise, true, and living God be glory, honor, dominion, and power. In the name of Jesus, go in his grace, family. Amen. We love you. Amen. Amen.